welcome, welcome to a new session of Knowledge Labs. This is the fifth edition that we have of this. And uh, as always, a wonderful place for us to have brand new creatives and brand new people from so many different genres that are going to be here to help tell us about what they do, tell us about their gear, try and inspire us, and um, hopefully make the world a better place. And there's no better place than our latest guest that we have. It's Trey Packard. Hello, sir. How are you? Hey, good morning. How are you doing, Andre? Very good, sir. Very good. Now, Trey is a quite a unique human being because he started an absolutely incredible foundation. It's called the Pangea Seed Foundation. And it's all about, and I'm not going to get in your way because I'd love for you to tell about more, but it's all about saving our oceans in its simplest form, if I'm not mistaken. So if you wouldn't mind, yeah. give us a little bit about who you are, what you do, how is it that your work is so crucial to what uh, you know the earth needs right now? Yeah, yeah, sounds good. Um, well, yeah, my name's Trey Packard, and I'm the founder and executive director of Pangea Seed Foundation, and we are an international nonprofit organization based in Hawaii um, that focuses on engaging individuals and community through science, education, and artivism, or as we like to call it, our C approach, the SEA approach. Um, and um, I started the organization in 2010, and while I was living in Japan, and I was doing a lot of uh, documentation of illegal wildlife trade um, in the, the first decade of the 2000s. Um, and that created this, this momentum in me to want to do something with um, uh, you know, my time, my talent, um, and do it in a way that I felt would really engage and inspire people, and especially my generation at that time. Um, and we've just been going nonstop ever since. Um, we've got multiple programs. Uh, we do all sorts of really uh, unique and um, uh, I guess one of a kind of approaches to ocean conservation. I'm sure we'll get into those today. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to share what we do. And yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity to, you know, be on Knowledge Labs right now. And uh, especially during World Oceans Week, this is this is really cool. Exactly. And it's and it's I feel like it's well, I'd like to talk about that in a second, but I want to go back for a little bit because I read that, you know, your idea for this first came when you were on a beach in Sri Lanka. So you were on a beach in Sri Lanka and you first kind of had this brewing around that you wanted to create this foundation because you felt there was a real need or a danger that our oceans were in. And specifically the manta rays, I think, were one of the first things you focused on. And then you got more obviously into the whales and everything else. But can you tell us about how, what was that initial spark for you that said, I'm not happy with this, something needs to be done here and I'm, not, I'm going to be the one to fix it? Yeah, definitely. I think for me, the, the, that, that shifting moment would have been um, around circa 2009, 2008, 2009. Um, and I uncovered the largest industrial shark finning operation in Asia. Um, and at that point, like the, the impact of that was so, uh, I guess, heavy that, um, you know, I, 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 I really understand the importance of showing the realities of the issue. And photography yeah. is an you know, incredible way to do that. It's a weapon of you know, mass construction. Um, but at the end of the day, I really wanted to get people engaged and inspired, you know, like, I, like, for example, like I live in Hawaii and, you know, even though we're, I live in on a, on an Island, there's so many people that are disconnected to the fact that, you know, our impact directly affects the environment and directly affects the ocean. So, um, uh, I, I grew up in a family full of artists. My mother was a professional artist and art teacher. My grandfather was a professional musician. So we were always encouraged to use creativity to problem solve growing up. Um, and when I started toying with the idea of, you know, starting my own organization, I looked at conservation at that time. And again, this is, you know, over a decade ago. So things have changed quite a bit in that arena over, over time. But yeah. originally, it was quite conservative or militant, and it really didn't work for me. So like I grew up in um, on the coast in Southern California. And, um, you know, I, I think in my DNA and my background, you know, I grew up surfing and skating and, you know, hip hop and punk rock and I mean, these were the things that, you know, drove me as an individual. Um, and I mean, there's a very much a culture within those communities. Right. And uh, that for me, at first, that was the, the community that I wanted to get engaged. Um, so I just kind of relied on what I was into, you know, which was art and photography and music and film. And, you know, how can we use these incredible tools to better educate and inspire people to want to give a shit about the ocean. Sorry, uh, to want to care about That's the okay. Oceans. We are. Okay, go. Are we're, we we're pretty liberal about here. <laughs> this is expressionism right here. Go for it. Oh, oh, yeah, and it's early morning here. So, um, but yeah, right. like I, I, I think that's one of the main issues that we have in terms of like, you know, why the oceans are not more of a, um, 
uh, you know, I guess more of a importance to people's everyday lives um, is because there's this massive disconnect. And there's a big publicity problem around it, you know? Um, it, it's very much, you know, out of sight, out of mind. But, you know, I, when it comes down to it, without healthy oceans, life on land is impossible. Um, and I think, you know, from, from my background, you know, jumping back to, you know, when I first started the organization, um, like I'd been traveling and on the road for like close to a decade at that point, all through Southeast Asia, around the world. Um, and a lot of that was, was based on my passion for, for diving and just being in the water. Um, I kind of got fed up with a corporate job in my mid twenties um, and decided that, you know, that, that lifestyle wasn't for me. And I just jumped ship and uh, bought a one-way ticket to Japan and never looked back. Oh um, and then, it, yeah, I just took like, you know, a backpack with me. And of course, you know, there was a camera in there because um, in, in university, I studied um, mass communications um, and took several photojournalism classes and just fell in love with it at an early age. Um, and I don't know, I guess I, I've got a foot in analog and a foot in digital. Um, so, you know, I started on an old Nikon uh, F series that my grandfather, it was my grandfather's and learned how to shoot on that, learn how to shoot film and learn how to develop and um, made that shift to, to digital. I still have my first digital camera. It's a little Olympus point and shoot that nope. weighs a ton. And yeah, 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 I think I got it circa 2001 or something like that. Big card. And yeah, yeah it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty funny. Um, but uh, well, let's, yeah, let's, like, let's, let's go, go back. Ahead, go ahead. Let, let, let's sure. jump back just a little bit. Cause I, it's something that I'm, I'd love to get your take, obviously that you're so much more involved in, in, into this, uh, the conservation of, of, of the oceans. Why, why do you feel that there is this almost fatigue of people that is, is it of caring for the oceans and caring for the environment? Do you feel like it's just being politicized? Do you feel like there's a lack of education around it? Or do you just, frankly to say, I feel like a lot of times people just don't have that knowledge of my actions will affect everything else directly just further down the road and I may not feel it. So I'm not going to care about it. So that's kind of, I think that's really one of the main things that people, as long as it doesn't impact their little circle world, they just don't quite understand the impacts that they're having. Are you, have you noticed that as part of your sort of outreach of pushback that you may have had? Yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. I think there's, there's multiple factors that are kind of like, you know, floating around of, of why, you know, people and governments haven't taken action, um, you know, on the level that we need to. Uh, and yeah, I, I think, you know, we're, we're just inundated with, you know, information on a daily basis, you know, people are just trying to survive, especially in the past, you know, year and a half, what's happening, you know, in the, in, with the pandemic, you know, the environment has kind of taken a back seat in terms of people's priorities. Um, and we were just kind of getting to a point where, you know, plastics were becoming more of kind of like a household conversation and things like that. And, yeah. um, yeah, I think we're, we're, we're taking a step back a, a bit, unfortunately, but, um. Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's just a, you know, a big disconnect. Uh, we, we're the only species on the planet that disconnects itself from, from nature, you know? I mean, we, we create our, our own environments and we don't live in harmony. And I think what's happening right now in terms of climate emergency and you know, biodiversity loss and so on, I mean, that's a result of that. So um, yeah, our, our kind of approach as an organization has been to you know, try to make these environments you know, interesting and you know, somewhat cool you know, through the art that we're using and the artists that we're working with, um, you know, to, to, to make people, you know, want to stop and pay attention and care. I watched um, something related to this. I watched something on Netflix. I forgot the name of the show now. Um, it's completely escaping me, but it was uh, David Attenborough, who's my, okay. my absolute God. Um, yes. yes. Did, uh, they did a program on how the pandemic has affected sort of the, the, the wildlife, the earth in general, had the rainforest, and they did a section on, on oceans. And it's incredible to see, even though you're saying, and I 100% agree with you that it's, you know, the focus has been on, on the pandemic and everything that's going on. In some ways, that's been actually a really, it must have been a blessing for the oceans, because as part of his show, they were just saying how, you know, even in such a short period of time, which is a year, no, you know, the, not as many boats, not as many cruise ships that are just destroying corals and whatever, whatever else that's going on. The, the it's, it's starting to sort of cleanse itself a little bit. It's starting to just regenerate, you know, rejuvenate itself from all the damage that we've been doing. So this kind of even just a one year break, it's incredible how the planet has reacted to that. Have you, have you noticed that from some of the scientists maybe that you're working with that where, where even though it's, it's kind of been that blessing of just taking a breather for a while? Yeah, it's definitely been a double-edged sword because, you know, without the, uh, I guess the, the, the pressures that were there, 
um, I guess the piracy around that has, has kind of sprung up in certain locations because there's not a lot of, uh, you know, patrolling or enforcement at the moment. So some species have been suffering more than others, um, you know, in, uh, ecosystems as well. And then um, on the flip side of that is that, you know, some of these locations and, and species have had an opportunity to have like this moment to breathe. Um, right. And it just shows the resiliency of nature, you know, right. if, like humans are not sitting there, you know, continuously whacking at it. Um, there is an opportunity for it to flourish. Um, I know like early on in the pandemic, you know, we were seeing stories of like, uh, you know, lions and, and different, you know, uh, marine mammals that were coming into areas that they hadn't been in in, in you know, decades. Yeah. And we yeah. experienced that here in Hawaii. There were several beaches that turtles started to coming in to nest on that, you know, they had never had before. Uh, because there were tourist destinations, you know. That was actually um, part of the video. You, if you should really watch it, I think it's on Netflix. But it's, that's exactly what they were saying. That I think it okay. was a forty percent increase in in number of eggs that were laid uh, because they could finally come to the beach when there were no tourists. So it's just it's it's an incredible how reactive it can you know earth and resilient it can be. Yeah, exactly, exactly, and that's something that um, especially within Hawaii, within kind of the local communities, is talking. There's been a lot of talk recently about you know creating windows when tourists could or, and couldn't come in so there can be an opportunity for the environment to be yeah. you know have this opportunity to heal so um i think it's great that you know the pandemic out of the pandemic you know there are opportunities to start conversations like this because this is very very important um you know uh, like most tourism locations if the environment's not healthy people are not going to come so you know uh it, it's it's critical that the governments are taking those steps to to make sure that those environments are safe and healthy but ultimately, I think it's just going to come down to human greed. I mean, at its core, that is really yep. the main driving force because some government yeah. or, or even a, a section of a town that owns that beach is going to say, you know what, we want to have these tourists because we've been struggling for it. So again, that double-edged sword, people are struggling. They don't have the money. We want to have more people, but the more people you have, the more damage it does to the environment. So I think this is, you're right. I think it's a, it's a great opportunity for us to reset, but I think I, I worry about the, the human greed of it. Um, Definitely, definitely. And everything you're seeing in the headlines right now is like, oh, we're back, you know, and, and let's go on vacation, you know, let's right. consume, let's do this again, let's go back to the status quo. And it's just like, we can't do that. And I fear that we will, unfortunately. Yeah. That's the issue. Um, let me ask yeah. you a really uh, simple and dumb question. Why ocean? Sure. Well, you, could have picked, um, you could have picked space, yeah, that... you could have picked plants and micro <laughs> microorganisms. I mean, oceans are definitely. such a broad thing. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a great question. I, for me personally, like the, the ocean has always been, um, I guess, you know, a place of healing and, and reflection and centeredness. And um, it's always provided me so much. And like I said, I grew up on the coast and, um, you know, like it's just always been something that's been part of my life. You know, I, I guess it's something that I never necessarily took for granted, but it was always there. And it was something that, that, that there was always this kind of like, I guess, un- um, uh, this is a draw to it that I, I, I still can't put my finger on. I'm kind of stumbling trying to explain it now, but mm. um, yeah, it's always been something I've been drawn to and cared about. And I, in the, the early 2000s, I think that's when I really started to see the impacts that humans were having on it. I got uh, dive certified in like 93 around, around there and um, I've been diving all over the world ever since. And like, um, Patty you know, just, what is it? Patty or Nawi? Oh, I'm a Patty. Nice. Boy. I'm a I'm, I'm a <laughs> but I like Nawi yeah. too. Nawi too. Now he's a great, uh, a, a great organization as well. So, yeah. um, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, getting out there and, and, uh, I feel like I was lucky enough to really experience the oceans before the climate emergency really kicked in. So I've seen this transition in my lifetime, um, you know, diving to spots that, you know, I went to five, 10, 15 years ago and going back, you know, now it's night and day. You yeah. know, I mean, like, yeah. like the, the, the damage, the irreversible damage is just, you know, unmistakable. And um, for me, that was the, the kicker. It was just like, okay, something that I care so much about is in trouble. So, uh, you know, for me, there was no question. I had to do something. It was just a matter of like what I was going to do. Yeah. And, and I, w my wife and I are huge divers. We've been dive I've been diving for over 15 years, uh, again, around the world. And it's, it, <laughs> We, we haven't, we didn't dive too many times in the same locations, but even then when I do remember like Hawaii, that's just more accessible. You can see that coral degradation that, that we remember it not being that, that way. So it's, it, it's scary how quickly and how rapid that change can be. Um, yeah. With, with minimal increases in, in global temperatures, it can really create absolute havoc. Um, 
what what do you feel like the biggest danger is to the oceans of obviously humans when we fully yeah, understand humans. that but, it, but if it's if it's something that you in a perfect world that you'd like to change as, as far as your organization like if you were just to educate people stop mm. this one thing is it is it plastics is plastic still the main driving force no i th- i mean definitely plastics is a major issue um but it's it's the the climate emergency that, that is the the main thing right now because there are so many repercussions from that you know like you know the impact of, of oceans warming um you know it, it it has an impact on biodiversity loss you know the the, the um the, the health of the water itself well losing um, algae as well which is which yeah, is exactly. a humongous problem for everything because yeah. that drives everything yeah yeah, and like the other day, like I went into town to get in the water and like uh, our, our water locally, I mean, we, we're in kind of like a remote location in the Pacific and our water is usually kind of in the mid to upper 70s. And we were like, like in the 80s, I think is what it was the other day. And yeah. I mean, we're, we're, we haven't even really kicked off summer yet. So um, right. yeah, Hawaii has just suffered, you know, massive bleaching events over the past couple of years and different areas that I like to go free dive and, and you know, photograph that, you know, I've seen a drastic changes in, you know, the span of a year. So um, the, the, the scary thing about that, from my perspective, is like, even if we do put a cap on carbon right now, um, you know, the genie's already out of the bottle, you know, yeah, the, the yeah. damage is going to be happening for, you know, decades to come. So, um, I think that's the main thing is, you know, for people to, to understand their carbon footprint and reduce that as quickly as possible, take responsibility for it. I, I fully agree. And I'm, I'm very fortunate because I've, I've traveled to tons of countries around the world. And I think, I think one of the biggest challenges that I'm seeing is not necessarily in the quote unquote developed world to me it's in the undeveloped world um you know even going to places like the philippines where you're just driving around and it is just tons and tons of of trash and garbage that but the government either doesn't know what to do with it doesn't know how to handle it doesn't have the funds to be able to do it um doesn't have technology to be able to dispose of it properly i feel like Yes, it's absolutely brilliant for us to be able to do something in hawaii and in uh, you know in miami and all that stuff and it needs to be done i feel like that education needs to be broadened so much more to some of the other governments that may not have the capacity to be able to do that. So I think it's it's just it needs to be on a global scale is really what it comes to. Definitely, out. definitely. And I think Even that's great more. that you brought up developing nations because you know a lot of the products that you're seeing there, you know, these these are products that are developed by you know a Nestle and a Coca-Cola and things like that. Right. Um, and you know, so they're taking advantage of, of selling their products in in countries where there's not the infrastructure set up to be able to dispose of it properly. There's not the education in place. You're dealing with you know communities that probably up until 10, 15 years ago, um, there was this culture of like, okay, you know, for snacks and whatever, you pick that off the tree, yeah. you eat it, and then you pitch you know the wrapper, which was you know a banana skin or something like that. So there's still that mentality there just to kind of throw things away like that. Yeah. And let it, you know, kind of go back into the environment. But, you know, there's not a lot of ed- education in place about what that does to the environment. Yeah. And it's not just necessarily just building it. It's a question of, I'm um, sorry, not just selling their products. It's, it's really the cheap labor and, you know, the, mm. the globalization of it and the way that they're producing it is just Definitely. not done with the same standards that, quote, again, the developed world has established that they can dump stuff sort of left and right that no one's going to bat an eyelid because of corruption and the government turns a blind eye to it. And, yeah. And again, it comes down to that sort of, oh, it's just a little bit of trash. It's not going to make a much difference. It's just this one beach, but it, they, they don't quite follow through the entire life cycle process of what that's doing to an ocean 50,000 miles away. Um, exactly. So exactly. That's, that's, we I, were out on, a, I was going to say, we were out on a hike over the weekend um, on the coastline here um, in a kind of a remote area. And there was a, a, a pocket of the coastline where there was just a ridiculous amount of plastic they had washed up and it's all marine debris um yeah. and there were big crates from japan we found one uh piece that had like uh uh, uh i guess uh, uh uh hindu writing on it um i mean there's just trash from all over the place you know and it shows yeah. kind of like you know that away is never away yeah well as part of your organization i believe you might have some stuff to share for us so i think you might have a video that might get kicked in so yeah, We'd love yeah. to see that just to give people a bit more of a sense of really what you guys do. I know it's only a, around a two minute one. So uh, I highly sure. encourage everyone that's on this that would like to find out more to just go onto your website. We'll create a link for that and, and post it. But if we can um, kick Sounds that great. video, that would be great. And we can talk about that. We all came from the sea. And it is an interesting uh, biological fact that all of us have in our veins the exact same percentage of salt 
in our blood that exists in the ocean. And therefore, uh, we have salt in our blood, in our sweat, in our tears. We are tied to the ocean. And when we go back to the sea, whether it is to sail or to watch it, we are going back from whence we came. That was awesome. <laughs> I mean, that's just a, it really just that that video just encompasses pretty much everything that you guys are doing in terms of what you're trying to do. And it, but it does lead me on to an interesting segment, which is something that we touched upon before, that there is this sort of fatigue, I guess, in the world about, you know, you guys are just another organization that's just trying to save the oceans. It's the same story. Nothing will change. Nothing gets done. However, you guys do something a little bit different in terms of the way that you market it, which is that use of art. So through your murals, um, just to kind of tell me a little bit about that thought process, the why you, you guys decided to go, we're going to try and get more awareness by doing these murals. Is it the size? Is it the color? Is it just to, to be different? And, and how, is, how are you finding that? Yeah, definitely. Great questions, man. Um, so what we just watched was a, a promo video for our for Pangeasy Foundation Seawalls Artists for Oceans program. So that's our public art program. Um, <clears throat> where we engage communities directly uh, through uh, the means of public art. And um, public art is just such an incredible, you know, platform to be able to, you know, educate and inspire people. Um, like you're saying, you know, there's so many organizations that say, you know, we're saving the oceans, we're doing this, whatever. Um, and you don't really know what they're doing, but like with a program like this, you're bypassing a lot of that and you're taking, you know, these messages directly to people, directly where they live, meeting them where they're at and transforming, you know, those communities. So normally with the program, we're creating, you know, anywhere between like 10 to 20 large scale public murals in a specific location at a time. So we're basically taking over a cityscape. Um, and you can see by some of the, uh, the images in that video, you know, we, we go large, you know, we're painting, you know, 10, 15 story buildings, massive water towers. Yeah. Um, and with all these, you know, messages about issues that are ocean environmental issues that are important to that community so you're left with a constant reminder so in a sense you know these are almost like permanent billboards right right um, you know to highlight issues that most people don't care about or, or that aren't sexy like you know climate change and biodiversity loss and you know sustainable seafood options and things like that so um yeah it's been an incredible platform to to, to really be able to you know directly connect and engage with people and leave a constant reminder so um, I mean, you can imagine, you know, for a kid going commuting to school every day and he's confronted by this, you know, 50 foot mural about, you know, shark conservation, you know, every day that he's seeing that going to and from school that has an impact. Same right. with, you know, people that are commuting to work every day and so on. So we were very strategic about the locations that we paint in and then the, you know, well, the process me, leading up to that. 
But let me ask you about that because that's interesting in terms of the locations. I, I, I noticed that sure. if you go on the website, you can see all the locations that you guys have done murals. And it's from what you said, water towers to, to down planes to side of buildings. They're pretty massive. How do you choose? And maybe you, I, I believe you might have a PDF of showing some of the work. Uh, if sure. you want to share that, how do you how do you choose a particular location? Do you reach out to the local communities and say, this is what we want to do? Or do you reach out to the artists who then do that work kind of on, on your behalf for it? Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, so um, it, it's kind of like a traveling circus to some degree. Um, each project is anywhere between like 12 to 18 months in the planning because we really focus on, on you know, engaging community stakeholders, community buy-in because the program being nomadic, it's critical that, you know, the community takes ownership once we're gone. Um, and that's the exciting thing to see what happens, you know, once we do leave in and the murals have time to kind of marinate and resonate. Um, but in terms of choosing locations, um, originally I was choosing, you know, places that I felt would be, you know, would benefit from doing something like this. Um, and then over time, um, it's become, you know, an international program and we're working with, you know, thousands of artists and, and you know, uh, curators and uh, scientists and researchers. So at this point, people reach out to us and pitch bringing the project to their community. So, so that's, that's where we're of, at right now with it. And we, yeah. So it's kind of taking sort of it's sort of taking on its own. It's it's become bigger than that because now you're not relying on doing this or all the work. People are coming to you because they're hearing your message and they want to they want to share it. If let, let's see some of the artwork because I I'm I personally love color and I love paint. I am, I use it throughout my work, but seeing murals and I, I'm a huge fan of murals I just think they're people just don't give them enough credit of, of the sort of artistic skill that's needed to do yeah. something especially on these on these kind of grand scale sizes it's one thing to do you know something on a large piece of paper or whatever but this is these are gigantic and they're absolutely stunning so um maybe you can talk about some of yeah, the can you see it now I'm sharing my screen yeah we can see it I guess okay great great well yeah this is just kind of a you know, uh, I guess a typical example of like, you know, one of our murals and um, I do a lot of the photography of the, you know, the work in progress, uh, you know, the finished murals and I love telling that story, you know, through through photography and, and that that's something that I've been lending to the organization for years now. Um, so, you know, being able to create moments like this, I think are, are, are very, you know, special and impactful. You see the scale of this, um, the message behind this. Um, and, you know, just people kind of commuting around and, and, you know, that's, that's, you know, within the environment that they live in. Um, and yeah, like you're saying, you know, street art, I think is really taken off in probably like the last five years, yeah, especially, yeah. you know, there's in, in the corporate sense as well, you know, there's a lot of brands that are utilizing it to promote their products or their messaging or whatever. So we yeah. have kind of come to a watershed moment with it. Um, but yeah, we wanted to use it for a tool for advocacy. And in this case, you know, for ocean conservation. Um, and we're working with artists from all around the world, all different skill sets, all different backgrounds. And for my position, that's one of the, the things that I get to do that I really enjoy is the curation aspect of it, of choosing, you know, yeah. artists uh, and creating the lineups for the locations that we're going into. Um, but yeah, this is a mural that we created in Cozumel. Cosmo, awesome. Yeah, if you can scroll, yeah. I mean, I think you have quite a few of these. We can scroll through them as we're, as we're sort of chatting. And that, one question I had sure. is, in terms of the artists that, that are, you are either reaching out to or they're reaching back to you, do they present the idea of this is what I want to do, this is a rough sketch, or do you kind of, how much, like you said, how much curation do you really have in terms of what the yeah. image looks like? It's very curated. So each location is site specific, you know, whether we're going to um, you know, taking this to the subarctic, like we have in the polar bear capital of the world, or down to you know a remote island in Indonesia in the Coral Triangle. Each location has its own set of problems. So, in the lead up to that, we're working with you know researchers, scientists on the ground, um, and getting that information about what topics would be best to highlight. Right, um, right. And then what we do is create like a topic deck that we send to the artists, and the artists we work with them to choose that topic. And the artists are on a volunteer basis, um, so we. I, this isn't necessarily an art commission. So we want the artists to have their creative freedom and to yeah. translate the, you know, these specific topics in a way that they feel would be impactful for the community. So this is one that, that we painted in Napier, New Zealand, uh, which is right on Hawks Bay. Um, and there's an issue with, uh, with boat strikes, brides whales. Um, so the artist wanted to try to communicate that in a really unique, creative way. So this is yeah, artist named so Chris awesome. Konecki from San Diego. And yeah, he painted this in New Zealand for one of our projects there. Yeah, this is a mix of underwater photography as well. These are different <laughs> artists that we've worked with to 
just you know do different things with their artwork to to you know create a narrative so that's giving me anxiety I could, <laughs> <laughs> i'm like getting claustrophobic just looking at that that's yeah, awesome an artist yeah from poland named oleg and she's a crochet artist and um we did this whole whole piece together where uh we were using her artwork to to create uh messages around uh, ocean engagement and inspiration and um yeah this is some of my underwater work um, this is like something that we've done through our organization as well over the past several years is, um, you know, I, I try to marry my passions because at the end of the day, if I'm not passionate about what we're doing, the organization kind of stalls. Um, so it's, it's, it's important to be, you know, doing things that, you know, really fire us up internally. Um, and one thing that we do is expeditions around the world to different locations to get people in the water in a safe and sustainable way with, with different, uh, marine megafauna. Um, and this was after a day on the water with uh, humpback whales in Tonga um, in, a, in a cave. And that's my wife free diving. Um, uh, I, still yeah, haven't, yeah. I have not been to Tonga. I've been to Palau. I've been to Bora Bora. I've been to, goodness, where else have I? Philippines. I've dove in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Tonga is definitely one of them. Um, that's, yeah, that's awesome. Oh, Galapagos, Hammerheads. Yeah, so, so this one was um, a tribute mural uh, that we created for a dear friend of ours that passed away a few years ago. He was a, a photographer and, and uh, documentarian named Rob Stewart. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with his work, but he did a series of documentaries, one called Shark Water, which was responsible for kind of creating the, the modern movement to protect sharks. Um, but yeah, he, died, he passed away in a, a, a tragic dive accident several years ago, and Goodness. we wanted to highlight his legacy. And he, he was a close friend and collaborator we both really understood the, the, the power of, of imagery and art to, you know, educate, inspire people. Um, so this uh, artwork was created by an artist named Freeman White from New Zealand. And what we did was we worked with the Stewart family to, uh, to, to take some of Rob's photographs yeah. and create a composition to create this mural. So this is basically what, what Rob was seeing through the viewfinder. And there's a quote off to the left that, 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 that was from Rob as well. And I love, I love that the artist actually did the reflection of the shark on the pavement. That's, I've never seen that before. I think that's oh. absolutely epic. Is that, is that done? Was that, is it, is it water or was that actually paint? That's water. That's oh, water, cause so. that would have been even better. If, <laughs> if, if someone painted that on the ground as a reflection, right? that would have been epic. That's a great idea though, Andre, I'm going to steal that. <laughs> Please do. I don't even need yeah, to be quoted, but, but that, to me, initially when I first looked at it, I was like, that is epic. The fact that you're, you're, you're doing a double reflective mirror on that one, that, that would be cool. Yeah, I, I, like, I, I, I try to photograph all the final murals um, that, that live on our website because a lot of times, you know, with these projects, not everybody can go to these far off destinations to experience them. So, you know, social media and, you know, our, our website and so on have been that tool to, to that, so people can experience these murals. So, you yeah. know, after each project is finished, I go out and I photograph everything and I take my time and I look for opportunities like that. So like those reflections and different, you know, unique moments to really capture, you know, the scale and the impact of the mural. And it's great to be able to, you know, highlight animals like this, you know, this is a great white, you know, the, yeah. and it's the, that it's quite demonized, but it's an endangered species. And it's critical that, you know, people understand that these animals are important to the health of the oceans. And, you know, this is this amazing opportunity to create something that's like, I think this wall was maybe like 17 feet by like maybe a hundred feet. So it's a pretty big wall. Um, and yeah, you know, it's like 12, 12, car, 12 car places across. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And it looks like uh, that's the hammerhead migration out of the Galapagos. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, Rob was active in the Galapagos. And yeah, I, that was uh, some footage from shark water there. Yeah. yeah, I went to the Galapagos once and I never, I, I didn't dive there because it was the wrong time of year. It, it would have been, I needed like a 10 mil suit. But uh, I did do oh, a man. little bit of, a little bit of snorkeling if you want to call it that um we didn't go very deep obviously but uh it was my dream to see an, an iguana free swimming that was just it was one of my bucket were, were you able to see one i did one the marine iguanas i yeah. got one of the marine yeah. iguanas it was Great. eating some moss and it was free it, 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 honestly that was like one of those you know huge bucket list check off and I, I couldn't even capture it on camera and i do want to start talking about gear as well so we'll get to that in a second but yeah yeah um, definitely, definitely yeah go please continue oh i was just going to ask real quick regarding the galapagos were you able to see darwin's arch before it collapsed no, uh, that was really annoying. We, the route that was taken with the boat was not, that wasn't one of the ones that we hit, unfortunately. So I will never be able to see that in, in full, full view. I, I'm in a similar boat. We were like for about a year in the planning of doing a project down in the Galapagos, the Seawalls project, and everything got put on hold because of COVID. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, I'll never get the opportunity to see Darwin's Arch and, you know, in, in, in all of its glory. It's, so. it's, it's really an incredible place. Um, I, I, it's, <laughs> 
it's it's so rugged and it, it, it just feels like you're stepping back in time it feels like what it's the closest that i could sort of sense of what the dinosaurs period looked like and it just it's it's an incredible location i advise everyone to go but do it obviously in a sustainable way and don't yeah. trash it yeah Definitely, and actually, to be definitely. fair, I have to admit, I went there quite mm-hmm. a few years back. It was around five, five or six years ago. And I was really impressed with the authorities. They were, they were on you in terms of don't have too many people here. You can't walk on your own. You can't step off here. You get in, you know, they kept telling us how much trouble you'll get in if you touch this, if you, if you litter, if you do whatever. They were very, very... Um, yeah, there were more repercussions set in I, place. At more than any other country that I've, that I've been to. So they really were... I remember that distinctly that they were really trying to make it trying to make a point that we're trying to preserve this you're just you're here as yeah. a guest. so it, that was yeah, great exactly I, I and i totally agree i think they they're one of the rare countries that kind of like you know set the precedent and and you know we're a role model or our role model for how tourism can be more sustainable palau is very similar yeah um yep. I, I did my dive master in palau and spent nice. quite a bit of time there um back i don't know 2010 2011 and um it, it was just really ex- exciting to see that. Like that was around the time that the government created the world's first shark sanctuary, and um, you know they really put into to focus that you know it is a tourist destination, and to keep this you know sustainable, we have to take steps to protect it. Uh, yeah. And that started with you know educating the tourists and you know the, the 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 people that were making money off tourism. So yeah, I think they've done a wonderful job, and that was one of the things that we were supposed to highlight through. The project in the Galapagos was some of these, you know, uh, uh, rules and regulations that have been put in place, but doing that large scale through artwork. Yeah, but I, I remember again because I I went to Palau, I dove Palau, it was awesome. Uh, but I did Jellyfish Lake, which again was another huge bucket yeah. for me. But even even yeah. that, I mean, even something as simple as literally getting into a lake in a controlled quote unquote controlled environment, you know, everyone's turning up there with sunscreen. Everyone is just God knows the damage that's being done with all the chemicals that you're putting in there in and in, in the lake is not massive it's not a you know you know this it's not a gigantic piece of piece of uh, right. water what's the damage that's being done so again th- there's so many more things that we can do in terms of the sunscreen that we use how many people are allowed to go there on a daily basis and maybe shutting it down for half a year to give it time for mm-hmm. it to properly recoup anyway that's that's for another conversation sure sure i think i read at one point where because of the impact that tourism was having on jellyfish <clears throat> like they put a hold on allowing people in for like a certain amount of time to let it uh oh know, is that right like oh that's and, yeah i, I, I didn't sure i didn't I read, read that that's that that's years great ago. to hear because it was i mean it was quite packed when i was there and, I'm, and again that was that was at least eight years ago nine years ago that i was there so i'd yeah. like to go back yeah. i'd like to die I, I love diving i, I did the um the it was a german channel yeah german channel is amazing i saw yeah. a hammerhead in, in the channel um yeah it, 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 it was such a cool drift dive it was so yeah. much fun that's the yeah. beauty of a drift dive because you just sit there you don't have to waste any energy exactly just inflate a little bit and just cruise yeah, yeah it's you a just, good time it's yeah. just literally it's a it's a screensaver that's going across your face definitely definitely one of the best drift dives i've ever had was in, uh komodo um oh, that's, don't now yeah. now you now you're starting to make me jealous <laughs> that is that's on my bucket list to, to go to komodo and see a dragon it was incredible we did a series of liveaboards and we were out there for about three weeks. And um, one of the drift dives we did was like, you know, early morning, you know, waking up, you know, sleep still in your eyes, throw on your gear. And, you know, immediately when we jumped in the water, it felt like we were being flushed down a toilet. It was just <laughs> ripping. Um, but yeah, I mean, once you kind of, you know, oriented, oriented yourself and kind of got into it, it was, it was just an incredible experience. It was so much fun. We did, I, this is the last thing we're talking about scuba diving, I promise, but one of the <laughs> one of the scariest things that I've ever done in my entire life, and I'm not scared of the dark, I'm not scared of anything like that. This, one of the scariest thing was I did the blackwater dive in uh, in the big island. Oh yeah, know. yeah, yeah, off Kona. Yeah, that's a good, that that's a great That scared dive. the living bejesus out of me because you are looking down at a black abyss, you're tethered to the Thousands boat. Thousands of feet. Yeah, yeah. You're, away, you're two miles offshore, it's, it's midnight. Yeah. And you're, you're, you're looking down into nothing but black, you're tethered to the boat, you're jumping in, and all of a sudden, you just start seeing these bioluminescent stuff. And then every now and again, you'll just see this big eye that yeah. just sort of swims by. You're like, <laughs> that's a shark. That's definitely a shark. And it's like a few feet from me. Anyway, that, I would love to go back and do you that. You definitely feel vulnerable in that scenario, for oh, sure. For it, sure. I felt yeah. like a freaking embryo just floating in space. Right, um, yeah. Let's talk really quickly because obviously we're showing a sure. lot of the photography. Let's let's switch into uh-huh. uh, into the gear that you use now. What what do you shoot on? I see I see from your photo that you were on a Canon. 
Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I my primary rig um, is a uh, a Canon 5D SR. I fell in love with that camera several years ago when it when it first came out, and I bought a couple of the bodies over time, and it's just been such a reliable, you know, workhorse of a body. Yeah. Um, and I, I, like all my lenses, pretty much, I have a few signals, but the majority are Canon. Um, and I've just had such good luck with, with that body. It's 50 megapixels. So the versatility of what I can do with the files afterward is just, you know, it, it's, it's huge. It's, it's like, you know, the, the files that it creates. Um, and especially for what we do as an organization, we print a lot of our work. Yeah. Um, so, you know, having that flexibility to be able to, you know, edit and, and not necessarily, you know, compromise the integrity of the, the image, um, is, is just, it, it's fantastic. And uh, I've just, I fell in love with that camera and, um, I've had other people tell me, um, that, you know, there, you'll, at certain points, I guess, in your, your career, you know, as a photographer, you'll find a piece of tech or a piece of gear that just works for you, yeah. you know, and everything else just kind of, you know, becomes a blur. And, um, I don't know, I mean, there was a period there where, you know, I did really focus on, you know, what was coming out, what was new. Um, but it was a bit draining financially and <laughs> mentally. So, you know, I wanted to get stuck into the, the, the process and the experience versus, you know, the consumerism of it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of in a position now where, like I said, you know, I've got a, you know, a go-to rig and it, I'm super happy with it. I, I like the 5DSR. I, the only issue that I had with it is that I really didn't like its noise levels. And it was mm -hmm. it was still off in terms of some of the color channels. I think Canon usually, if I remember correctly, struggles with the red channel. I don't right. quote me on that. Don't quote me on that. I need to do my remind me remind myself. But it's look can, that thing is it's sturdy. It's it's it, it's reliable. It very rarely breaks down. The I had you know I shot on Canon before I was on the phase, and you can you can take that and beat the crap out of it, and it's still going to work. Like you said, it's it's, it's incredibly reliable. So. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I've always liked, I mean, just the way that I've always shot, like I need weight in my hand when yeah. I shoot. Um, so, I mean, I've, I've played around with, you know, some of the Sony's and some of the, the Olympuses and, and the Fuji's, um, but I always go back to my Canon. I mean, it yeah. can be a pain in the ass sometimes because of, you know, the weight behind it, but, you know, it just, I think it's like, I, I come from a background of, of playing music as well. And it's, it's similar to that where, you know, you, you, you have gear that is reliable and helps you get through the job and, makes right. it enjoyable and that's how i've been with canon yeah i couldn't yeah canon is definitely a workhorse no no question about it um how do you feel about mirrorless um yeah yeah i think they're they're, they're fascinating i mean it's just the, the 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 technology how it's developed over the past you know 15 20 years has just been you know incredible and like i was saying i've got a foot in, in analog and digital and and you know, making that transition, uh, I, I remember at the time, it seemed, it seemed like, you know, such a novelty. Yeah. Um, and to see where we are right now with it, it's just absolutely, you know, mind boggling, you know, the, the quality of the image and, um, you know, what you can do with that and, and you know, the, the speed and yeah, 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 the cost, you know, the versatility, yeah, it's, it's phenomenal. You remember when the Canon one, the first one DS was like 8.2 megapixels, which was <laughs> something like 10 megapixels and it cost like 25 grand or something ridiculous. Yeah, We've yeah. Come We've come such a long way, which again comes with its own problems and complications because now everyone can get a good camera and everyone's a great photographer. And right, there's, right. I think the skill set of and the technique and your composition and what you're trying to achieve and the story you're trying to tell is kind of gets lost a little bit, but that's that's for another that's for another topic. Um, yeah. Yeah. So again, I'm, I'm glad you brought this image up because I was going to ask you about your underwater gear. Um, mm -hmm. Is that so you take your 5DS? 5D SR underwater as well. You have the, the whole underwater casing with it, with the with the lights. What is it? The the yeah. the, the Ericon lights or Ericon? Uh, what, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, mine. Uh, well, my, the, the rig that I'm using for underwater is a uh, uh, Aquatica uh, uh, housing. Casing? Yeah. Um, yeah, and I've been working with them um, for for several years now. Um, they've been really supportive of what we do as an organization, and you know, offering uh, great discounts and things like that to help us get out in the field and you know, take images and do what we do, document what we do. Um, and then for my lights and my strobes, uh, I've been using uh, Ica Light. I really Ica love Ica right. Light. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they're quite heavy. Uh, I, it, it's a model that's been around for a while now, but they're just again workhorses and super reliable. And yeah, um, yeah, like for me, dialing in what works underwater took took time. You know, it was a lot of uh, you know trial and error, and um, uh, like uh, you know a, a, a lot of expensive errors over the years, but. Yeah, um, yeah, it's it, it's been such a journey, and I and I absolutely love it. it. It's been, you know, I think for this 
point in my life, it's been one of my my great joys. I think a lot of I think a lot of photographers don't quite don't fully understand or appreciate just how different underwater photography is. It is it is a complete different completely skillset. different animal. Yeah, different animal, different skill set, different set of. Um, it, it's almost like your your mental your mental frame has to change as well because of the way that you're working under difficult conditions, um, your, your settings, you have to know your camera inside out, even more exactly. than on land because you can't make the adjustments that you can on land. Uh, right. Extra gear, like you said, I mean, those lights, you, you probably use a two light setup, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So a two light setup with the casing with, with, with a 5 DSR. I mean, you're looking at what, 15 pounds probably of gear going down? It's, yeah, or more, yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah, and if something goes wrong, your whole gear is ruined. Your camera, yeah. you know, if, if you have any any issues or bubbling that's coming up in your uh, in, in your in your housing, it's uh, it's pretty much game over. So, it's, definitely, it's, it's definitely, risky. especially when you're out in the field. I mean, a lot of the places that you have to go to to experience these animals are way out there, so you don't have like a you know right. a camera shop that you can pop into to, to prepare something. So, a lot of times, I'll I'll travel with backup gear. Yeah. Um, you know, extra lenses, extra bodies, extra, you know, uh, strobes and things like that, just in case, because you've invested so much time and energy to get to this location that, you know, if something does go wrong, you know, not having a backup plan is, is on you at that point. What lenses are you on? It looks, this one looks like you're on like something like a 24, 24 to 70. Can you get that? I don't know yeah, exactly. Like 24 to 70 is one of my favorite. It's um, especially underwater. I shoot with an eight to fifteen uh, fisheye. That's 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 a Canon. That's just an amazing lens as well. Yeah. Sixteen to thirty-five wide angle is one of my favorites. Yeah. Um, for telephoto work, um, I bought a Sigma. I took a chance, and um, I don't know. This was probably two thousand twelve, but I took a chance, and Sigma released this fifty to uh, five hundred um, uh, telephoto. That like I've just fell in love with it. It's been such a cool lens to play How with. How do you get have, the house? Crazy... Well, you have the housing for that? No, no, not not for underwater. That's oh, what I was gonna say like yeah, five <laughs> hundred. What? <laughs> yeah, uh, but I just I love that lens for like landscape and you know or not necessarily landscape but yeah you know telephoto. Um, and I've just had so much fun with it. But I also uh, shot or shoot with the 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 Canon one hundred to four hundred. Um, uh, recently, my father-in-law he's a professional photographer he's based in switzerland um and he shoots pretty much predominantly with Can with canon so, so a lot of the times when he's getting new gear he'll kind of like you know awesome hand down. Me down yeah so uh he passed me on a tilt shift uh i don't know last year and that's one that i i haven't jumped into it yet but i'm really excited to start playing with the, it. the 17 yes yeah. it, I, I have that lens it's epic it's yeah it's so heavy <laughs> oh I, well I, i'm on i'm on phase gear right now which is around eight pounds for a lens that lens is pretty wow. now to me but that lens you you should really explore it because you can do some really funky stuff it's just it's got the bond lens so you can't put any filters on it unfortunately so you will have some lens flare coming up but uh it, it's it's a phenomenal lens you can really really do some cool stuff with that <laughs> Yeah, we, we've got our next major seawalls project is happening next month in Boston. And we've got, um, let's see, 12 large scale, scale murals going up. And, you know, uh, I, I'm really excited to try to photograph murals with the tilt shift um, to get that soft focus and, and do some really interesting, um, you know, uh, uh, documentation around the murals. Um, so, yeah, yeah, that's what, one that's going in the, in the, the camera gear bag for, for that project. Well, I was going to ask you about that because some of the murals being so big and sometimes you may mm -hmm. not be able to step back as much. You do you have you ever used a technical camera to be able to shoot to keep everything? No, in I, not yet. Not yet. I mean, a lot of it, a lot of the shooting that we're doing is on the fly. So, for example, like this photograph yeah. right here, I'm in a boom lift, probably like 30 feet yeah. up off the ground, um, you know, trying to get the shot here. So um, a lot of it is is, you know, either handheld or, you know, monopod or, yeah. um, you know, different things like that. And and, and uh yeah yeah that, that's the way i've been doing it over the years yeah using a technical camera for something that's super close like that's awesome but you have the space here to be able to do it but even then at least it doesn't it, it stops you from having that distortion on the edges exactly with the 17 you're gonna you will get distortion on the edges no question of that yeah so um yeah, so you can see, well, I guess, kind of jumping back real quick, the caliber of the artwork that we're creating, the messages that are kind of, you know, embedded into these. Um, this is like a housing block in, um, where was this? This was in Cancun, Mexico. Um, and that area of Mexico, uh, the R Riviera Maya, is like one of the 
Um, the main places around the world for dolphin, dolphin captivity. I think there's more dolphins in captivity in that stretch of land than anywhere else in the world. <clears throat> so the artist wanted to address that. Um, this artist was from Spain. Uh, um, his name is uh, Spock is what he goes by. And so he created this really, you know, creative piece that's called Game Over based on kind of like a gumball machine and, you know, people yeah. playing, paying to play, so to speak. And yeah, this is one that was focusing on shark conservation. It says, Moria, uh, what is it? Moria y Porti, I think is what it was, which means, um, well, uh, I can't remember what it meant. Uh, it, it was something along the lines of like, I will die for you. Yeah, like death, something death related. Yeah. 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 So showing that, you know, the, these animals are, are sacrificing themselves for our pleasure and gain. Um, and this is uh, by a renowned artist named Tristan Eaton, based out of LA. And um, for this project in particular, this was actually the first Seawalls Artists for Oceans Act uh, project that we did. And uh, this was off the coast of Isla, Isla Mujeres in Mexico. So we took 15 artists um, out to experience um, endangered whale sharks and manta rays and have that first person experience. And yeah. then based on that experience, we went back into the town and they created artworks based on that. So um awesome. having yeah yeah it, it was a really Tangible. incredible experience yeah yeah exactly. yeah that's a, that's a whale shark we we dove in uh in the philippines uh did you do don soul i forgot I know, or, that that tends to be a hot spot in the philippines for it's, for whale was, sharks that migrate through there i remember it was like a seven hour grueling ride from manila that's probably it yeah, yeah. just on like yeah just the worst roads <laughs> but it it's, it's a total adventure Oh, yeah. it, it, sure. If you call it that. Yeah, it was, <laughs> I, I, we were the only ones that, we were the only ones that were scuba diving, which kind of really annoyed me because everyone else was on, on boats similar to that. And they, as soon as they see them, they just go in and start splashing around them. You, you need to keep, you know, six feet away. We were just observing them from underneath. Um, we didn't get close to them at all. We were, like I said, we were the only two that were actually in, in uh, diving, but it's, yeah, I, it, it's such a, it's such a fine line between wanting to experience nature and not realizing that you're actually potentially doing damage and scaring them and affecting them and they, they were feeding them you know they were it wasn't their natural quote-unquote environment they, they come there because they know they're getting fed so it's it's not i don't know i don't know how i felt about that one i, I didn't know yeah that yeah until I I got think there. you might are, are you talking about where the fishermen are on top of the water and they're feeding them through nets yeah i exactly. think that's like Crin, crinchia or something bay is the name of that location yeah i i don't I don't recall, but it's it, it, was, yeah. it was a place. I, I didn't know that's what was going on. Um, I, I was glad that we were diving. I, I specifically wanted to dive because I, I knew I didn't want to get too close to them per se. I wanted to sort of observe them as natural as I could. But there were like there were yeah. ten boats around us. It was just it wasn't as in, it wasn't as enjoyable as I wanted it. I was hoping for it to be. But yeah, I mean, getting to experience one, you know, just kind of like by yourself off in the wild is is always, you know, incredibly, you know, uh, uh, it just it's an amazing experience. But a lot of the, the the tourism that's developed around this over the past, you know, decade, um, it has been a gold rush. You know, uh, there's yeah. not a lot of uh, regulation and um, you know education put in place, especially from the tourism aspect. Yeah. Um, Places that we have worked with uh, uh, for that, like this, this was off the coast of Mexico, um, and um, like what we've seen, just radical transformations in the past, I don't know, two three years, in terms of the the protocol of how people are able to experience the animals now. Less boats, and they yeah. make it more competitive, where it's a lottery for the boat, the the the, the, the uh, I guess the the the, the companies to yeah. yeah the operators. Um, and yeah, it, it, and now they're kind of policing each other and keeping tabs and, and it, it's developed into something that's a lot more sustainable than it was, you know, 10 to 15 yeah. years ago. But the, the, the rub of that is, you know, these are communities that at one point fish these animals. So yeah. it's kind of like, you know, it's, good, it's one or the other. Um, and hopefully, you know, we can focus on, you know, sustainable tourism um, that, you know, will benefit, you know, the communities, you know, pro provides a educational experience for the tourists and, you know, hopefully at the end of the day is not, you know, impactful on the, on the animals. Right. Because you're affecting, you are directly affecting their behavior. The, these, these animals are not yeah. used to coming to a location because, well, because well, they know that food is going to be readily available per se. Obviously they know that some krill right. in certain areas and certain times of the year, but they keep coming back to the same place when they would have maybe be going somewhere else because they know it's guaranteed. So it's, we don't want to be affecting marine behavior from that. Exactly. For, for our yeah, enjoyment exactly. and our pleasure. And I, yeah. So I, 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 I from our perspective, I mean, any place that does, you know, practice feeding, that's something that we would never support. Like um, the projects that, that we've curated and then, you know, the excursions that, that I do personally, um, it's all, you know, it, you know, in water wild experiences. So like 
Um, in Mexico, this is just a migration. It's the largest migration of whale sharks yep. on the planet and they're following the food source. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, that's awesome. Um, I'm, I'm, I'd love to see if you guys could do some aerial photography <laughs> of the oceans and these yeah. animals while you're at it. Cause I'm, that's just we, one of the things do. that I love to do, but I, I, it would be great to sort of add a different, a different perspective of it. Perspective for sure. For sure. Like that's something I personally haven't, uh, I guess dove into yet is, is like drone photography and aerial photography. Um, but on all of our projects, like you can see from the video, um, we're working with drone pilots. So we yeah. usually bring somebody in that handles the video. Um, and, and because for my position, I, I do a lot of the PR and a lot of the public facing, you know, just, you know, talking with the artists and property owners and so on. And yeah. um, so there's a lot that I'm responsible for. So we outsource a lot of the documentation to, um, you know, people on our team. Awesome. Well, we are coming up to the hour mark and, uh, uh, I should have asked this earlier. I apologize for anyone that's no, that, no worries, that's, no worries. That's still well, even just for people that are still with us. If they had any questions that you'd like to ask Trey, uh, this would be a good time. And don't worry if you miss a question. I'm sure he'll be available to answer any any questions that you guys send in to us, um, and he can get back to you. But um, I guess as a as a closing, if we don't have any questions, um, as a closing, what's what's you know, your ultimate message? What's what's the final sort of parting thought that you'd like to leave our, uh, our viewers with? Yeah, um, definitely one thing is, you know, to to check out Print for a Cause. Um, so it's a, a new book that we've uh, uh, collaborated with, with F-Stop. Um, and that's one of the things that I wanted to share today, you know, during the World Oceans Week, this is a retrospective of um, our work around the world. Uh, a lot of the murals, uh, original illustrations, underwater photography. It's a really unique, one of a kind book. Um, we've released only 2,000 uh, copies of it, so it's hyper limited edition. Yeah. Uh, Pre-orders are up for uh, for sale right now um, on the F-Stop website. You can um, uh, visit that, or you know, check us out on social at Pangea Seed at Seawalls, and there's links to that there as well. Um, the the proceeds go back to support what we do as an organization. Yeah. Um, and it's been a pleasure to collaborate with with F-Stop. You know, over this past year, it's been a a, a journey. Um, you know, blood, sweat, and tears, uh, it, uh, it definitely re reflection because I've gone back through our, you know, 10 years of our archives and, and really did a deep dive to, to curate the, the selection of photographs that are uh, in this. So brought up a lot of memories, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, and it's just been, yeah, a fascinating journey. Um, so we're really proud of this book. Um, uh, beautiful, large scale uh, coffee table book. So definitely check it out. Uh, grab one, support, you know, artivism. And I guess the parting words is, you know, it's in your hands, you know, as consumers, you know, on a daily basis, you know, the, the way that you consume is a vote for either, you know, a beautiful, sustainable future or death and destruction. So, um, you know, taking stock and responsibility in, in what you do on a daily basis, um, I think is key. Um, and I think if, you know, if more people did that, we would probably be in a better position. So, um, yeah, during, you know, World Oceans Week, which is uh, going on this week, yesterday was World Oceans Day. Um, it's basically, if you're not familiar with it, the, uh, the ocean equivalent to Earth Day, United Nations recognized holiday as well. Um, you know, definitely, you know, thank, thank your lucky stars for, you know, the services that our oceans provide, you know, every second breath we take, um, you know, that regulate climate and weather, uh, provide, you know, protein for over, you know, 3 billion people on our grossly overpopulated planet and, you know, a source of fun and inspiration and so on. So without healthy oceans, life on land is impossible. And we got to do what we got to do in our daily lives to make sure that we're protecting it, you know, at all costs. Couldn't agree more. I, and I, and I'm a huge fan everywhere. I, wherever there's an ocean, I will be the first one to jump in. So it's uh, absolutely, it's needed. Um, just thank you again for, for, for joining us. And thank you for your organization. It is, is incredibly needed in, in today's more than ever, I feel, uh, and increasingly so more than ever um to sort of continue oh, thank you andre it's a pleasure man yeah to spread that message we need we need to have more more awareness more of the right awareness without without um overwhelming people and people losing interest because i fear that this is really what's happening so your organization is, is, is obviously different with 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 a very strong message so um all our guests thank you for joining us thank you trey so much um johnny in the background thank you sir for uh, for keeping this on track and making it all brilliant. And we do have new guests coming up um, in the next few weeks. So keep an eye out for all that. Thank you so much, sir. I appreciate your time. And um, we'll put links for all the, uh, for the websites and everything that you guys do. So everyone can check it out. So. 
Yeah, yeah. If anybody wants to check it out, support what we do, you know, be, you know, be a part of the team, reach out. We're very active on social at Pangea C at Seawalls underscore. Um, and we'd love to hear from you. So um, it takes, you know, um, for, 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 for what we do as an organization, it's, it's, it's a collective and it's the more people that support what we do, the better off that we're going to be. Um, and definitely harness that creativity, all you shooters out there, you know, use, use your, your, your gear and, and your talent to help give our planet a voice that's critical.